Daniel, for those of you who uh, are visiting with us, welcome. My name's Steve, I'm one of the pastors here. And somebody asked me earlier this week, Steve, why don't we just, why don't we, well I was saying to them, I'm, I'm finding it really difficult, it's been a horrible week preparing this bit of the Bible to preach for you. And somebody said to me, well why don't we, do we have to do it? Why don't we move past it? And the reality is, is that if we do not look at the kinds of things that come up in this chapter of the Bible, if we cannot look at those in the presence of God and with his word open, then what we're doing is sending a subtle message that these are things that we shouldn't talk about. That won't happen here. But I'm also aware, I'm not doing this cavalierly, I'm also aware, because I know you, I also know the statistics, that some of the stuff that's going to get spoken about today will be very, very present and real. So my promise to you is that I've prayed for you, my promise to you is that I'll try to be as gentle and as real and as christ fills as possible as we look at this. We're about to read a section of the Bible which I both wish wasn't there, but I'm glad is there. I wish we don't live in the world of this chapter, but we do. So I'm so glad it's there because it gives us a way forward. I'm going to let you in on a little secret. The title of the message before I even read the Bible is One Who Can Heal and Deal. One Who Can Heal and Deal. And if you look for that one in this passage as we read it, he is conspicuous by his absence because he's not being recognized there. And this chapter as we read it is supposed to leave us crying out for what is missing so I wonder, even as I read it, try and listen out for what is missing. One who can heal and one who can deal. So we're in Second Samuel chapter 13. For those of you who've got your Bibles, please make sure you're following through. It's on page 223 if you've got one of the church Bibles off the back. If you've got a different Bible and you're not sure where to, uh, Second Book of Samuel is, look it up in the index. That'll help. Chapter 13, what we've just seen in the previous two chapters is the King David, the one that they've been looking to as the hope of the nation, the king appointed by God, has failed monumentally, morally speaking, and there has been a big fallout. But we're jumping forward a couple of years, and we're going to see how the apple doesn't fall far from the tree, and the fallout is amplified and carried over in the mess in his family. Chapter 13, verse 1. In the course of time, Amnon, son of David, fell in love with Tamar, the beautiful sister of Absalom, son of David. Amnon became frustrated to the point of illness on account of his sister Tamar, for she was a virgin, and it seemed impossible for him to do anything to her. Now Amnon had a friend named Jonadab, son of Shimei, David's, David's brother. Jonadab was a very shrewd man. He asked Amnon, why do you, the king's son, look so haggard morning after morning? Won't you tell me? Amnon said to him, I'm in love with Tamar, my brother Absalom's sister. Go to bed and pretend to be ill, Jonadab said. When your father comes to see you, say to him, I would like my sister Tamar to come and give me something to eat. Let her prepare the food in my sight so that I may watch her and then eat it from her hand. So Amnon lay down and pretended to be ill, and when the king came to see him, Amnon said to him, I would like my sister Tamar to come and make some special bread in my sight so that I may eat from her hand. David sent word to Tamar at the palace. Go to the house of your brother Amnon and prepare some food for him. So Tamar went to the house of her brother Amnon, who was lying down. She took some dough, kneaded it, made the bread in his sight and baked it. Then she took the pan and served him the bread, but he refused to eat it. Send everyone out of here, Amnon said. So everyone left him. Then Amnon, uh, Amnon said to Tamar, bring the food here into my bedroom so that I may eat from your hand. And Tamar took the bread she had prepared and brought it to her brother Amnon in his bedroom. But when she took it to him to eat, he grabbed her and said, come to bed with me, my sister. 
Don't, my brother, she said to him. Don't force me. Such a thing should not be done in Israel. Don't do this wicked thing. What about me? Where, where, where would I get rid of my disgrace? And, and what about you? You would be like one of those wicked fools in Israel. Please speak to the king. He will not keep me from being married to you. But he refused to listen to her. And since he was stronger than she, he raped her. Then Amnon hated her with intense hatred. In fact, he hated her more than he had loved her. Amnon said to her, get up and get out. No, she said to him, sending me away would be a greater wrong than what you have already done to me. But he refused to listen to her. He called his personal servant and said, get this woman out of here and bolt the door after her. So his servant put her out and bolted the door after her. She was wearing a richly ornamented robe, for this was the kind of garment the virgin daughters of the king wore. Tamar put ashes on her head and tore the ornamented robe she was wearing. She put her hand on her head and went away, weeping aloud as she, as she went. Her brother Absalom said to her, has that, Amnon, uh, sorry, has that Amnon, your brother, been with you? Be quiet now, my sister. He is your brother. Don't take this to heart. And Tamar lived in her, brother, uh, in her brother Absalom's house, a desolate woman. When King David heard all this, he was furious. Absalom never said a word to Amnon, either good or bad. He hated Amnon because he had disgraced his sister Tamar. Two years later, when Absalom's sheep shearers were at Baal Hazor near the border of Ephraim, he invited all the king's sons to come there. Absalom went to the king and said, Your servant has had shearers come. Will the king and his officials please join me? No, my son, the king replied. All of us should not go. We would only be a burden to you. And although Absalom urged him, he still refused to go, but gave him his blessing. Then Absalom said, If not, please let my brother Amnon come with me. The king asked him, Why should he go with you? But Absalom urged him, so he sent with him Amnon and the rest of his, the king's sons. Absalom ordered his men, listen, when Amnon is in high spirits from drinking wine, and I say to you, strike Amnon down, then kill him. Don't be afraid. Have not I given you this order? Be strong and brave. So Absalom's men did to Amnon what Absalom had ordered. Then all the king's sons got up mounted their mules and fled. While they're on their way, the report came to David, Absalom has struck down all the king's sons, not one of them is left. And the king stood up, tore his clothes and lay down on the ground and all his servants stood by with their clothes torn. But Jonadab, son of Shimei, David's brother said, my Lord should not think that they killed all the princes, only Amnon is dead. This has been Absalom's expressed intention ever since the day that Amnon raped his sister Tamar. My lord, the king, should not be concerned about the report that all the king's sons are dead. Only Amnon is dead. Meanwhile, Absalom had fled. Now the man standing watch looked up and saw many people on the road west of him coming down the hillside. The watchman went and told the king, I see men in the direction of Horonium on the side of the hill. Jonadab said to the king, See? The king's sons are here. It has happened just as your servant said. As he finished speaking, the king's sons came in wailing loudly. The king too and all his servants wept very bitterly. Absalom fled and went to Talmir, son of Amahud, the king of Geshur. But King David mourned for his son every day. After Absalom fled and went to Geshur, he stayed there for three years, and the spirit of the king longed to go to Absalom, for he was consoled concerning Amnon's death. May the Lord add much blessing to the reading of his word. Let's pray together. Lord, we wish it wasn't so, but we see something of the brokenness and mess that is in the world caused by the rottenness of the human heart. We praise and thank you, Lord, that you are a good giver. We praise and thank you that you have pledged yourself to renew and redeem, not because we deserve it, but because you're that kind of God. 
And we pray, Lord, as we look into this dark chapter in Israel's history, and as we look at it with our histories in view, we dare to pray that you would bring mercy and grace. Lord, show us, we pray, how you heal and how you deal. Please, Lord, in Jesus' good name. Amen. And before you put your Bibles down, I need you to see two things here. I need you to see two verses, and I need you to spot what the difference is, but they're not in that chapter. One of them is a couple of chapters before, and one of them is a few chapters later. So, you only need to turn back to one page, and you'll find, sorry, two pages, and you'll find 2 Samuel chapter 8 and verse 15. And I'm going to read some strange names to you, and I want you to spot and clock what is recorded here. David reigned over all Israel, doing what was just and right for all his people. Did you hear that bit? Joab, son of um, Zariah, was over the army. Jehoshaphat, son of such and such, was the recorder. Zadok, the son of such and such, and such and such and such. They were the priests, blah, blah, blah. blah. Yeah, you get that bit? Now, flick over to chapter 20. So go forward about six, seven pages to 2 Samuel chapter 20. And verse 23, and you've got a very similar list. Joab was over Israel's entire army. Benaniah, son of Jehoiada, was over the Kerithites and the Pelethites. Aradoram was in charge of the forced labor. Jehoshaphat, blah, 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 blah. There's something very similar about those lists, but there's something very different. Tell me what is similar, tell me what is different. What's similar and what's different? Say that again. You're right, the Lord's not really mentioned, that's right. Thank you. So you've got two lists of how the kingdom is working, but there is one big thing that is missing. In fact, you can argue quite strongly that there's a whole 12 chapters here that are to show us what happens when you slip from a kingdom and a rule that is marked by justice and equity, right being seen to be done, and then an absence of it. And what the writer of this book wants us to understand is that when you have not got a king who can deal with injustice, you're in a total mess. In fact, the argument would go that this is a microcosm of the Bible itself where we had a wonderful king and we walked out on him and chaos broke out in the world and it will always reign until we are back under the hands of a king who can heal all that is wrong and deal with all that is wrong. And as I said to you earlier, the apple doesn't fall very far from the tree. Because we realize that David was an imperfect man. He was raised up and he could win the battle against the forces of evil that were crushing the nation of Israel. But what he could not win the battle over was the state of his own heart. Yes, he was God's appointed man, but he was deficient. And if there is one thing that the Bible is pushing us towards in this early section of the Bible, is that if we're to have a true king, he not only has to be able to defeat enemies, he has to have a pure heart. He has to be one who lives and rules justice and equity and so what we're supposed to do by the time we get to the end of this story is if we are before Jesus we're supposed to be left going we need a better king we need one who can fix not just the big evils out there but the terrible evils in here because it's the terrible evils in here that break out into the out there but if, as we do, live after Jesus, 2,000 years on, we're able to look back to him and say, he is the one who can heal and deal in a way that meant, means that this mess does not have to be the end of the story. So please, would you grab a hold of your Bibles, have a look down, and we're going to follow through really closely to the story. And we find out in chapter 13 and verse 1, so we're back in chapter 13 in verse 1, in the course of time, Amnon, son of David. Now, David, by this point, I tell you what, he is something of a sexual predator, although he's the king, and he finds legal ways to do it. By this point, he's got ten wives. He's got a sexual appetite, and it was a way to establish his power and control. And it is never okayed in the Bible, but what we need to know is that Amnon is son of his first wife, second, third, and then fourth wife, 
We know of two children at very least, one of whom was called Absalom, who was second in line to the throne, and one of whom was called Tamar. Now, we know as we read through the story that Absalom was quite an ambitious guy, and we're going to see something of him. And in fact, this verse, notice how Tamar is introduced as the sister of Absalom. This is six chapters about the mess that comes through Absalom, but the thing that gets it going is the story and the account of what happens with Tamar. So you've got a bit of a power struggle that is brought about by David being a plonker, and that's what set it up. Now what we, you need to know as well is that Tamar was a daughter of the king, so a princess. So if you want to think about what her life would be, we find she would have had beautiful robes, she would, there would have been regiments to be able to keep the, the daughters of the king and procedures that would have kept the daughters of the king um, pure and proper. We're talking about a girl who was probably somewhere round about the same age as Ruth and Olivia, possibly going up as far as Becky, Catherine, Bethany. She wouldn't have seen 20 years yet. Now, I don't know them perfectly, but I know all the, the names of those young women I've just mentioned. Let me tell you something about them. They've got dreams and aspirations. They've got ideas about how their life will go. They think about maybe finding a relationship at some point and finding a place in the community, maybe having kids. There are certain things that they don't dream about. They don't expect to come into their world. Are you already getting a sense of how dark this chapter is about to go? In the course of time, Amnon, son of David, fell in love with Tamar, the beautiful sister of Absalom, a son of David. So Amnon has got a crush on and something that grows into an infatuation with his half sister who is younger than her, uh, younger than him. Verse 2. Amnon became frustrated to the point of illness on account of his sister Tamar. So when it says love, let's be, like, be really clear. This is a darkened form of lust. And immediately in this story, where we get a, an image of desires for good things gone wrong. We used to have a phrase that we would use in the, the English la uh, language called deviant. But basically, the Bible explains that we are all, to some degree, in one form or another, bent out of shape, started on a course that has gone to a a dark and dirty place. And you know the way that that happens, maybe not in this particular context, but maybe you know it in, all, in different domains of your life, is that what happens is we, we have to be really careful which loves and lusts we feed because they take on a life of their own inside of us. So we see something that we like a little bit and we start to ruminate on it and percolate on it. And we imagine with it, and the Lord has granted us the ability to imagine things. We put things together and we, uh, and we sort of answer the question, oh, I wonder what could be. And we play with that image in our mind and we nurture it and we put it on the, cupboard, uh, on the shelf in the cupboard and we take it off and we play with it. And for him it was, oh, doesn't she look nice? Look at the way she moves. Oh, she's, she's got that very modest dress on. But I wonder, wow, wow. And he leaves it for a bit. And then the next year he comes back and he starts to feel a bit resentful that he can't have. Do you notice what the language is? He was sick that he could not what? Could not. What's it say? He wants to do something. Does he want to do something with her or does he want to do something to her? So there was restrictions in place and he just played with this fantasy. Can I tell you that all sexual brokenness, it isn't something that we are born with. We feed our darkened lusts to the point where before we realize it, they are running us. They are ruling us. A dark desire becomes a ruling desire. 
to the point where every morning when he got up, oh, woe is me, I cannot have what I want. And he goes to bed, he goes through the day, he's feeling sick. We're psychosomatic, so if there's some sort of thing and what we want, it controls us and our mood and our stress and our illness. And this is exactly where he is. Please, let's be really clear about who we are as people. We are people who are wonderfully made in the image of God and we can do things that are brave and noble and loving and truthful and sacrificial. But we are also bent out of shape so we can set our eyes on something to the point where I say, I like it, I want it, I have to have it, why can't I have it, I need it. And you can do that in all kinds of domains of your life, but this has gone wrong in the sexual domain. That's what pornography is about. It is all fantasy. And the place where it starts is the nurture of an image and an idea that says, I want to have that, own it, use it, and bend it to my will. And there is a whole industry out there of men and women, predominantly women, almost always have had a very damaging past history and they are made to play out a fantasy that is not real. And it is a darkening, and it is a destructive thing, because it never delivers on what it promises. The worrying thing for us is that we live in in an age and a mood and a world that is very sexually permissive, but doesn't seem to have very many good answers as to how so many people are so hurting as a result of it. We see it here. Desire darkened but then there's a cheerleader look at verse 3 now Amnon had a friend named Jonadab son of Shimei David's brother so sort of like a cousin or a half cousin now I want you to notice how he's described Jonadab was a very shrewd man in some versions it says wise but it's closer to a shrewdness a sort of cunning and crafty in some versions Who does that remind you of? What Bible story does that remind you of? The snake in the garden. Do you remember the snake in the garden? Didn't have any power, but knew how to use his voice. And so he comes along and he he plays to Amnon's sense of entitlement. You're the firstborn king. This is terrible that you should feel this way. In fact, what does he say? Let's read it. He asked the son, why do you, the king's son, look haggard morning after morning? Won't you tell me? And Amnon said to him, I'm in love with Tamar, my brother's Absalom's sister. Go to bed and pretend to be ill, Jonadab said. When your father comes to see you, say to him, I would like my sister, Tamar, to come and give me something to eat. Let her prepare the food in my sight so that I may watch her and then eat it from his Uh, from her hands do you see what he's doing he's a friend would say whoa we're all bent out of shape and we let our fantasies run riot and it causes carnage slow down buddy but he goes to him and he says you're entitled you should i mean you're the king's son if you want it you should have it who should stop you this is terrible We want to live in a world, don't we, Amnon, where if we want something, we get it, and we get it the way we want it. And of course, it doesn't take much for Amnon to be, yeah, that's exactly right. So use your power, use your strength, use your ability to get what you want. Now, can I stop us right here and tell you, that is the polar opposite of Jesus Christ. The Prince of Glory, who has total power... He does not use his power to get people to serve him. He gives away his power to serve them. Do you remember that woman who, uh, who was uh, recorded as being a prostitute, Mary, who came to Jesus? All the other religious leaders around were, were criticizing and judging and condemning. But she wanted to come before Jesus because he, she knew that if there was one king, there was one reliable authority, one with power who would use his power to heal rather than dominate and take, it was Jesus. And she wet his feet with her tears and dried them with her hair. And they looked on and said, why? What's going on? Don't you know who this woman is? And he said, those who have been forgiven much. It changes them. So we have a corrupting of power. 
power and deviant sexual desire are a cocktail out of hell, aren't they? We've seen that all over our news in the last 12 months. We've seen it in the Harvey Weinstein or the Bill Cosby, and if we were to track back 10 more years, countless other powerful people and celebrities who have looked out there, felt entitled and saying, I could have it. I want it. I should have it. I'll take it. I will do what I want to her. So the plot begins to play out. And notice how the story gets told three times. And David gets brought in. For those of you who remember the story of David and Bathsheba last week, you'll, you'll remember that it is through lies and through lust that there is the bringing of this woman. And, and now David gets pulled into somebody else's scheme. And at this point, I'm thinking to myself, David, what are you doing, lad? You're supposed to be a good dad and protect your daughters. This is really weird. I mean, can't a mum cook her a meal? Uh, cook, cook him a meal? What's wrong with you? But what we see here in David is something that we'll see carrying on is that he has this inability to say no to his children. He won't pull them up. In fact, we see that in the second story that we had read, didn't we? He won't get in the way. He should have been more suspicious. This was against all protocol. This was against anything like this. His eyebrows should have popped up and gone, this is weird. What's really wrong with you? He should have sniffed it. But he didn't because he got into a habit of not being responsible properly for his children. And so what plays out is this horrible scene where you see this young, beautiful woman in a beautiful clothing trudging up the garden path to the house of a sexual predator. Sorry. Let's go to verse 9. Uh, verse, yeah, verse 9. Uh, verse 8 even. So Tamar went to the house of her brother Amnon, who was lying down. She took some dough kneading it, made the bread in his sight. So he's through there in the bedroom. She's trying to keep the kitchen door closed because she just wants, and she just feels this leery eye on her. But she can't close the door. And she's like, okay, this is weird. But David, my father, the king, has told me to do it, so I'm going to do it. And so she finishes making it, and she puts the food down, but of course, that's not good enough for Amnon. She took some dough, kneaded it, made the bread in his sight and baked it. Then she took the pan and served him the bread. But then he refused to eat it. And at this point, alarm bells are going off in her mind. What on earth has happened? Send everyone out of here, Amnon said. So everyone left. Then Amnon said to Tamar, bring the food here into my bedroom. So she'd left it, she'd sorted it so that I may eat from your hand. This is really weird. And Tamar took the bread. She should have run. She took the bread. She couldn't have run. She prepared and brought it to her brother Amnon in his bedroom. Then when she took it to him to eat it, he grabbed her. Has anybody got a different version in ESV? What's it say there? He took. The essence of sin in any direction is to take hold of something that isn't yours and it's not yours to take. Whether it is the glory of God, whether it is opportunity, whether it is something that belongs to somebody else, whether it is respect, whether it is a material thing, it is to take there's a violence in that word, he took. Do you remember David? He brought Bathsheba. And the emphasis was on that again and again and again. A taking of what doesn't belong to you. But when she took it to him to eat, he grabbed her and said, Come to bed with me, my sister. So he's already using force. And she replies with four things. Possibly five. Don't, number one, my brother. Hold on, this isn't right. Incest, you're, you're my brother. We can't, that's not right. 
Second of all, don't force me. Such a thing should not be done in Israel. And in that moment, she just goes big horizon and she says, we live in a world where the Lord is God and we're his special people and he's ordained a way that is good and righteous and wholesome and I want to live in that world. And we've been called into that world. But in this moment, you've gone totally silent to who the Lord is. You live in your own dirty, dark, created world. This should not happen in the real world. Please, my brother, let's not go there. Let's not forget that the Lord is God. Please, this reminds us that every time, anywhere we do anything, we do it all before the face of God. He is everywhere present. He is perfectly holy and he never, ever forgets. The Lord knows, the Lord sees, and the Lord cares. Amnon, that's who we are. This shouldn't happen in Israel. This shouldn't happen in our community. Thirdly, and what about me? Where could I get rid of my disgrace? This is going to change everything. I'm a person and you've turned me into an object. Let's track back a little bit. You know, when we use that phrase, uh, he said he, uh, he couldn't do anything to her. What happens for you to be able to start thinking about something like that is you have to dehumanize somebody and turn them into an object. You turn them into something that you are going to use. Now in the Bible, sex is a beautiful gift from the living God and what it's there to do is to nurture and celebrate covenant oneness. Can I say that again? To nurture and to celebrate covenant oneness two people commit in a covenant to stand together unified in all areas of life financially shields down hopes and aspirations shields down future shields down and ultimately and physically shields down connected that's why it's that's why we desire that a a, a a coming together that is community building. This isn't about somebody getting their jollies and getting the buzz that they want. And can I tell you that even if somebody offers you that willingly and you haven't committed to them permanently, it isn't yours to give or take. That's why fornication and sex outside of marriage is such an ugly and dark thing in the Bible. Because even if it's offered willingly, it is something that is not yours to take. Because the gift of sex has been given to us to glue people together and to foster community. And she looks upon him and goes, what about me? This isn't what this is supposed to be used for. And because... There's no such thing as safe sex. All sex carries with it, because it is so precious and meaningful, carries within it deep psychological and emotional baggage. If you use it in the wrong way, you abuse it, it's going to put tears into every domain of life. That's what happens. And she says, how can I carry this disgrace? In fact, it says it differently. Can somebody in the ESV read it, please? What does she say? Where did you hear that phrase? We've got to come back to it in a minute. Where could I carry my shame? That's not the only thing that she says. She says something about him. And in this moment where he is all take, 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 she's even thinking about him. She's one of my heroes in the Bible. Verse 13. And what about you? You would be like one of those wicked fools in Israel. That word wicked fool, it, it sort of uh, carries the idea of obscene and um, perverted. One who doesn't live in line with reality. You are putting yourself under a label. This will define and shape you. You're supposed to be the king. Do you want to be one of those kind of people? And then finally she throws up something desperate and I think this is a bit of an allusion to what David is like. Finally she says, please speak to the king. He will not keep me from being married to you. Because in those days if you, had, if you were raped or had sex outside of marriage, there was massive community impact around in terms of what your potential and what your future could be. It would push you down a line 
that quite often would be described as desolation. In fact, it does later on get described as that. She's saying, forget love right now. I just want to be able to live and, and secure and be safe. And let's go to David. Our, let's go to dad. We're far enough removed that maybe he'll put his blessing on. I mean, he seems to say yes to almost everything else. We can find a way through this. But of course, Amnon, does he want to listen to reason at this point? He is just driven to take and he's just driven by poor, uh, by pure evil. Then, sorry, verse 14. But he refused to listen to her. And since he was stronger than she, he raped her. And that word there is a particularly uniquely violent word. Now, of course, he suddenly realized at the end of this, that evil and darkened desires never deliver. They in some ways carry within themselves the part of the punishment when you pursue and you go after things that are not yours to have and or to take. They carry that kind of punishment and it's ugly. But in this moment he goes even worse. Then Amnon hated her with intense hatred. In fact, he hated her more than he had loved her. Amnon said to her, get up and get out. No, she said to him, sending me away would be a greater wrong than what you've already done. You're going to publicly shame me. You're going to leave me to a bleak and desolate future. How could you after what you've done to me? And here's the answer. Are you ready? But he refused to listen to her. He called his personal servant and said, get this woman out of here and bolt the door. That's not what it says, actually, in the original. It doesn't say get this woman out of here. In the original, it says get this out of here. Do you see what he's done? So his servant put her out and bolted the door after her. She was wearing a richly ornamented robe, for this was the kind of garment the virgin daughters of the king wore. Tamar put ashes on her head and tore the ornamented robe she was wearing. She put her hand on her head and went away, weeping aloud as she went. You know, there's a difference between guilt and shame. Guilt is... A sense of wrong for something that I've done. Shame is the sense of being wrong. One is something I do. Another is an identity that I live out of. Either by something that I've done or by something that has been done to me. She was one of the virgin daughters of the the king. Which meant she would have had that beautiful ornamental robe. The word that's used to describe that ornamental is the same as sort of coat of many colours. Where have we heard that before? Joseph. So it was, a, it was a clothing, a mark of dignity, of position, of safety, of security. And she falls down on the step and the door is bolted behind her. And with the echoing of that bolting in her ear, she looks down upon it. And it just clashes. It's like... This isn't me anymore. And with tears still wet on her face, she starts to claw at it and pull at it. And she takes the ashes that are nearby, which are the sign of mourning and distress and sorrow and brokenness. And what was her beautiful hair that had been regularly kept is taken and it's pushed in. And she runs crying. And the one thing that she won't do is go quietly. Hallelujah. She put her hand on her head and went away, weeping aloud as she went. And her brother Absalom said to her, let's give him some marks for trying to say something, but what he said is somewhere between utterly foolish and totally cruel. Remember, Absalom, we're going to find, he's a guy who schemes and plans. And he takes a step back from this situation and he doesn't just see his sister in her distress. He sees the whole context, remember? Second in line to the throne. 
Talk about abuse of power. Has that Amnon, your brother, been with you? Uh, yeah. As she's distraught. Be quiet now, my sister. He's your brother. Don't take this thing to heart. And that's it. Doesn't offer any comfort. Doesn't invite her to tell a story. Doesn't sit with her and weep and say these are things that should not be. He says, don't take it to heart, love. And behind this, you see his machinations to try to pursue his own personal ends. Oh, we find that he's greatly incensed by it, but he's going to use this. Don't take this thing to heart. And Tamar lived in her brother Absalom's house, a desolate woman. I hate that word desolate. (laughs) But it's such a motif for how so many people now face life. Can I remind you the two women we've seen? The one at the start and the one at the end. The one who had dreams and aspirations and she dreamt of a guy and building a family and this is how it's going to be. Perhaps she'd planned her wedding day and it was... And all of it ripped out. And now she's living in a wilderness, a desolate place. One of the reasons I'm doing this in depth is because I want you to know, because I want it to get out to our community, that if there is one place that you can come when you're feeling desolate, there is one place where you can come to find hope and be heard and not have to stay quiet. And not be the victim of power plays. And know that you're safe from sexual predators. Is in this place. Statistically, depending on which set of stats you read. One in six women will be sexually assaulted at one point or another. So I could count down the rows. One, two, three, four, five, six. You. Others, statistics, say that it is higher than that. Some of you know... And can fill out with painfully horrible coloured pencils what that word desolate means and how it plays out every day for you. And Tamar got nothing. But hold on, David's about to be mentioned. The king. When King David heard all of this, he flew into action to administer justice, righteousness, equity to bring healing and restoration to hear this story and to give to this woman what she desperately needed is that what it says what did she need that day what she needed with somebody who would come in a king with the authority and power to be able to carry her shame You see, the thing about shame, the darkness of it, it claims that it is your destiny. It claims that it is the most powerful thing. It claims that it has authority. What we need is a king who can come in, who has more power, more authority, and more claim over you than even the darkest and most painful of memories. And I believe that this church follows a guy called Jesus who rose triumphant from the grave, having carried a shed load of shame, not his own, upon himself so that it will not have the last word. Am I right? Jesus Christ is the one who comes in. Listen, when we have been wronged and we need healing so often, we can prolong and find it difficult to get out of the pain and the desolation that brings by not allowing a greater authority to rule and reign over us because it feels as if that experience and that trauma and that terror is all there is please can i tell you that's not true jesus christ is risen and reigning and he is the better king who is able to take his robes of righteousness And he looks upon the tattered, shredded robes and he says, come here, kid. This may have happened to you, but this is not going to define you. I define you. I will wrap you up in my robes of righteousness. Please, will you live out of that with me? 
Oh, every day you'll be tempted to look down and uh, the only ones that you'll be prepared to look at are the ones that are tattered and shredded because you feel like an oily rag. You feel like a piece of trash. But what you feel like isn't the fact because if I've died for you and paid for your sin and all of my healing power is available to you, would you please, and it'll take a while because you find it so hard to trust, but would you please let me daily robe you in my righteousness. Oh, you're determined that this means that all of your dreams are smashed to pieces and that you could never be married again. You could never be restored and made whole and know all those things that you were hoping for and dreaming for. Can I tell you, says this new king, that that isn't true? Because number one, when you weren't marketable and you weren't worth having, I claimed you. And I said, you will be the apple of my eye and the desire of my heart and I will set my affections upon you not because of anything that you bring to the deal but because that's just who I am and I will change your future so those dark shadows have less and less and less of an impact I will do that now whilst you know me and then in completion on that great last day you see that is the king that Tamar needed and didn't get But Jesus is the king that we preach and promise and present to anyone who is carrying wounds of violation, hurt and pain. The problem is, is it's almost too good to believe that I can be defined by the love of Jesus more than I am defined by the things that I've had to endure. Can I say that as a church, sometimes people who've had a hard time traumatic time might be a little bit awkward might sometimes be a little bit volatile can I tell you what you do you don't tell them pull your socks up, sort yourself out what you do is you show them Jesus (laughs) and you say he's covered it He's covered it. Do you understand me? And that is why this is the best place. We are not defined by what has been done to us. We're defined by the love of the king. We need a king who heals. But secondly, more quickly, we need a king who deals. Because we don't just need to know that we have a king who can heal what has happened and what has broken but one who is going to put right. And guess what? There's an absence of one of those in this chapter. In fact, the only king on the scene, he gets duped yet again. Let's quickly go through this. Two years later, and Absalom has been planning. When Absalom's sheep shear was ready, in other words, it's party time, he invited all the king's sons to come. So he's about to hatch his plan. He wants to get them there, and because... Everybody knows there's beef in the family. He knows he has to bring David in and get David to sort of okay it. So he puts on this whole family unity thing and he says, it's all going to be on my dollar. So I want all of the sons there and David, and we don't quite know the reason why. Maybe he just didn't want to create extra expense by being there. Maybe he was just doing what he so often did, which was being an absent, useless father. Please, can I just say to the dads, we can be guys who are wonderfully fruitful, productive, energetic dynamic in the workplace or on the footy pitch but when it comes to being at home we just sit off that's David and the mess is for everybody to see so David here okays this party and Absalom doesn't even try to hide it with his servants does he he says listen I'm about to give an assassination order and when I say it just do it will you and so when the moment comes the party's in high spring Amnon he's like okay I've managed to get away with this one. This is great. He's probably moved on to his next uh, sexual predatory thing, hoping he's got away with that. And then at the last moment when he's not expecting it, and the party's in full swing, murder. And everybody flies. David breaks down in tears when he gets the news. Notice who's nearby trying to put the interpretation and spin on everything. Jonadab, that cosmic meddler. Listen, there's all kinds of voices out there. 
that want to influence and shape. And they've always got an angle. Always, always, always. I love talking to Mike because if there's one thing that Mike's very good at reminding us, there are people who've got agendas out there and conspiracy is a reality. (laughs) Whether I agree with all of Mike's, I'll have to wake up and discuss it. We'll have to wake up and we can discuss it later. I love talking about somebody when they're present but not present. This is great. There is a conspiracist here. And David is under his spell. And what David should do is deal with it. But what does David do? Verse 35, Jonabab said to the king, See, the king's sons are here. It has happened just as your servant said. And as he finished speaking, the king's sons came in wailing. The king too and all his servants wept very bitterly. What they should have done was slapped on a sword and gone and seen Absalom. He should have dealt with it. He should have, if he'd dealt with stuff two years ago, would this have got to the place where it should have got to? Absalom fled and went to Talmir, son of Am- Amihud, who's, who's basically that means he's granddad, somewhere off. But King David mourned for his son every day. Who does he mourn for? Absalom, as much as Amnon. After Absalom fled and went to Geshur, he stayed there for three years, and the spirit of the king longed to go to Absalom, for he was consoled concerning Amnon's death. And the commentators, people who make comment on this bit of the Bible, are unsure what that last verse means. Does it mean that he had got a heart to go after Absalom to be reconciled with him? Or was it that he'd got a heart to go and deal with this but didn't. I'm unclear. But what it does say is that he didn't deal with it. What that nation meant, oh, by the way, huge snowball. This builds over the next five chapters. And you need to understand that this is not done away in a corner. Because if we turn back just one chapter to chapter 12, verse 10, somebody read it for me, please. The Lord spoke to David and said some of the implications that were going to happen as a result of what he did with his carrying on with Bathsheba and merging of Uriah. Somebody read chapter 12, verse 10 for me, please. Don't mind who? Go for it, Becky. So did you see that? This was spoken about by the Lord. The Lord had said that you've set this direction in your family of being a sexual predator, using violence to cover over problems and not addressing things as you should. And this is going to mark your family and it's going to get amplified and amplified and amplified and it's going to be out of control. And all the Lord needed to do to allow that to happen was just to step back out of the way. Have you noticed how quickly things go south when we're not looking up? When we try to live our lives devoid of him and his presence? When we don't lay hold of his grace and his mercy in Jesus Christ? There is no end to the potential of things going pear-shaped. And we see this building and building and building because it doesn't get dealt with by a righteous king. I want to say to you today that whether you have been victimized or whether you are a violent perpetrator, we have the same problem at root. We need a savior who will deal with our sin. And the Bible tells us that Jesus Christ not only came to heal, but he came to deal. He came to deal with our sin by taking the punishment from it, uh, of it and breaking the power of it for anybody who wants him to deal with their sin now. And for anybody who says, no, I won't have him deal with my sin, will he not deal with it? He will deal with it. But it will be then. You want to meet him as a saving king now rather than a dealing with king then. And isn't it wonderful that in the same event, the cross of Jesus Christ, 
Jesus can cover the shame of the hurting and deal with the sin of the guilty. He's the king they needed back there. They had to wait. Do you think they were more ready for him when he came? Oh, you'd hope so. But he's the king that we need right now. Some of you, as you've listened to this, the main emotion that has connected to you is a sense of either the wrongness of the world or the wrongness of things you've had to go through. And I, it hasn't been my delight in bringing that up. But I've brought it up because that's what's in the Bible and the Lord wants to meet you in the midst of that. But equally, some of you, you've looked at Amnon and Absalom and it's been hard for you because you've realized you're more like them than you wished you were. Some of you are both. And you're not even sure what hat to wear. Can I tell you that whichever of those summaries you feel most attached to, you need to go to one destination. And he's called Jesus Christ. In a moment we're going to sing about the deep, deep love of Jesus. It's a love that heals and it's a love that deals. It's an inclusive love in this sense. Whatever your need, <laughs> it will be met there. So as you evaluate and measure your emotion, take them to him as we sing. Let's stand while the musicians get over there.